Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. We're on a journey of going through the book of Revelation. Uh, first three chapters this semester. Especially keying on the seven church, churches, uh, letters to seven churches, letters of Jesus. And to the church... And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of God. Remember them. What you received and heard, keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names of insiders, people who have not yet not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot, out, uh, blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Let's pray one more time. We we'll pray for your blessings upon us and use your word to awaken us, to come alive, to respond to your lavishing love for us in Jesus Christ. Strengthen your people in Jesus' matchless and amazing name we pray. Amen. Jesus is writing seven letters to seven churches in the first century, which represents uh, churches in all the centuries, in 21st century as well. And he's speaking to us as if he's writing his letters to us. Content of each letter is appropriate for churches in any age, and we're now in this fifth letter, uh, letter the letter to Sardis, city of Sardis. City of Sardis. It's a modern, uh, they named Sart. Uh, it's in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. I've been to all these seven cities. cities. It was a capital of ancient kingdom of Lydia. It was a city of great wealth and fame. Tragic earthquake quake took place in AD 17. In John's day, a civic structures included a theater, stadium, a central marble road, and multiple temples, especially the monumental temple of Artemis. Uh, it was the Acropolis. Was an, uh, the Acropolis was a natural citadel on the northern spur of Mount Tmolus. It rose about 1,500 feet above the lower valley. Now, it was an Acropolis. This city, it was an, uh, an Acrop Acropolis. What is Acropolis? Greek root of the word, word ac acro means high. So it was a city built on high place, high city. Ancient cities often grew up around the high point in order that they could easily be defended. The Greeks and Romans usually included in their Acropolis' temples to the city's most important gods. So, for example, a Athens built a great temple on its Acropolis to uh, its protector goddess Athena, which, is the, uh, which the name uh, Athens came out of. Now, many Jewish inscriptions also exist in Sardis, confirming that multiple references in Josephus, secular historian, to Sardis' uh, Jewish population. Now, uh, only two times, this, this was an impeccable city you know, that protected itself, but only two times the uh, city was captured uh, because watchmen uh, neglected its, uh, his duty. Uh, they fell asleep. So, you know, like one or two, very few just uh, snuck in and opened the door and the city was captured. Uh, of course, this became a cautionary tale of misguided complacency and lack of vigilance. Although Jesus' rebuke identifies no specific source of attack, the church was 
similarly compared to what happened to the city asleep. So we see uh, names, kind of, you know, titles of the seven churches. Church of Ephesus was the cold church. Smyrna, suffering church. Pergamum, the compromising church. Thyatira, the sick church. Today, the fifth church. Sardis, the slumbering church, sleeping church. Philadelphia, the faithful church. Laodicea, the dead church. Now, if you take out two churches that uh, only had, uh, you know, uh, encouragement, uh, you can see the progression of what happens to the church when the church is, uh, you know, not right before God. Ephesus church did not have the first love, so it starts out by being cold when uh, we, are, we lose our love for Christ and love for people. What happens? Then we compromise with the world. Something else comes in. So uh, we become like Church of Pergamum, the compromising church. Worldliness come in. Now when we accept worldliness, it becomes principles in our lives that we live by, then you become sick. Thyatira was a ch sick church. And we see uh, Church of Sardis as a slumbering church, not because they're slumbering, not because they're just lazy, but basically the church is dying as we will look into the context. So you fall asleep because you're dying. Now, Church of Laodicea, which we'll talk about, you know, uh, the, as a last church we'll talk about will be a dead church where Jesus will be standing outside knocking at the door to get in. So we see that how, how this church as we are focusing on Sardis is slowly dying, falling asleep because it's losing strength to live. You know, a study shows that drunken drivers, they study uh, the drivers, drunken drivers and sleepy drivers are equally dangerous. So uh, whether you are drunken with worldliness or uh, sleepy because you lack focus, uh, you're, you're equally dangerous uh, as we live out this world. So we'll talk about this church. The title is Wake Up. Jesus is commanding the church to wake up through, let's say, five uh, sections, normal uh, outline of the letter is uh, this form, but five outline of the letter. First of all, the address, verse 1, oh, end of verse 1 to 2, rebuke, instruction, examples, the promise. This, this is the outline of the letter, and we'll discuss it together so that we'll learn to wake up in our spiritual life. First of all, the address. Verse 1 says, to seven, uh, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and seven stars. Now, uh, usually when Jesus addresses in his letters, he gives his characteristic, he gives his name that is appropriate to the church. And he says, he, uh, he, words of him who has the seven spirits of God. Uh, seven spirits, of course, is a figure of dis figurative description of the one Holy Spirit. Oh, there's only one Holy Spirit, one Holy Spirit. But the number seven in Revelation is a uh, you know, meaning of completion. So here's the Holy Spirit, one Holy Spirit that works completely to seven churches, empowering each churches completely. And he holds the seven stars. Uh, stars, as we talked about, uh, in previous chapters, signify messengers, people in the congregation, basically the seven congregants, seven people, seven kind of, kind of pe seven people, seven congregants in seven churches. So here's Jesus. Picture is Jesus holds the Holy Spirit, Jesus in communion with the Holy Spirit, and who holds the seven churches, seven stars, seven uh, congregants in his hands, and we can see that. You know, there's incredible fellowship, koinonia going on between the Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And we are right in the midst of that because we are in Jesus Christ. We are experiencing this communion and communication of the Godheads. And because we are in Jesus Christ, this is what we are experiencing spiritually. Uh, and the word star is used for us because the meaning of it is we are shining always in the shining, the light of Christ in the context of witness. And we see that in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, it says, that you may be blameless, talking about us, 
people in the church of Jesus Christ that you are to be blameless, innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of crooked and twisted generation. Boy, is this generation becoming that more and more crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights. ESV uses the word lights, but NIV uses the word star, and in fact, the original language means, can mean both stars and lights. Therefore, shine like the stars in the world. So we are to shine. Shine Christ to the world. Holy Spirit holds. Jesus holds the stars through the Holy Spirit. He empowers us so that we can uh, be bright. We can shine like the stars of the universe. Holy Spirit empowers us to be witnesses in this world. And we can see that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Verse 8, it says to the New Testament church, as the power of the Holy Spirit comes, it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he says, that you will be my witnesses all over the world, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world. Uh, we can see the same concept, but more vividly as a picture of Jesus Empowering his church, look at this, Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, it says, In between the throne and the four living creatures among the elders, I saw a lamb standing. Their lamb is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ standing. What is he doing? What is he doing? As though it has been slain with seven horns, with seven eyes. Jesus has seven eyes watching. What does that mean? It says, which are the seven, uh, seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Meaning, Jesus is looking at the world through the means of the, of the Holy Spirit, through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. What is he looking at? What is he focusing on? We can see in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. It says, for the, eyes, for the eyes of the Lord runs to and fro throughout the whole earth. To see what? To give strong support to those who, whose heart is blameless toward him. He's looking for people whose heart are after him to strengthen them, empower them, so that they'll shine like the stars of the universe. Ah, this is the picture. This is why now Holy Spirit is amongst us. Holy Spirit is looking for a heart that is open so that he can uh, give strong support, strength and empower so that we can shine uh, in our lives. Now, if you had a bad break, some of you did, some of you already told me, or at least some of you look like it. If you had a bad break, we can always start again because we are in Jesus Christ. Even if you fall, Jesus Christ is right underneath. He's the rock-solid foundation for us, and you will never fall lower than Christ. He's right underneath. We are justified in Jesus Christ. You can be forgiven again and again and again. You can always start again. If you have a bad break, you can start again. If you have a bad day, you can start again. If you have a bad life so far, you can start. Because we're in Jesus Christ. Now, uh, something might bother you here. It says, uh, you know, he gives strong support to those whose heart is blameless. Wow, I'm so blameful. Does that mean Holy Spirit is not going to empower me? I believe, you know, if He Holy Spirit only... Uh, empowers perfect people, none of us will be empowered. Right? Blameless here means those people who are blameless because of Jesus Christ. It's talking about repentant sinners, fighting saints, basically forgiven sinners in Jesus Christ who's, who, who is clean because of the blood of Christ, because he has died for them. So no one is blame, blameless. But we are blameless because we are in Jesus Christ. We can be strengthened again and again and again. And right now, if your heart is after him, Holy Spirit wants to strengthen you and empower you. And he works each and every one of us differently. We are all too ready to assume that God will deal with everyone exactly as he does with us. But he is no mass producer and treats no two alike as you will hear probably in the testimonies, that God works differently in different ways. He is concerned about you, each and every one of you. He's in the work of strengthening you, empowering you, forgiving you, cleansing you, maturing you, progressing you, so that you can live a life worthy of His grace, so that Jesus can be shown to you and shown through you. 
The greatest evidence of God's love is Jesus Christ. Just look at Jesus. He gave his only son. What else wouldn't he give to us? He's ready to forgive you, strengthen you, empower you, and you need to start all over again. Just be hungry and be after Christ. Just always be hungry to receive from him. I've been your pastor for 27 years. And uh, it is my desire to always be hungry. Always be hungry. I want to be the hungriest person in our church. So by any chance, you've been here. I know some of you have been here 27 days. Some of you have been here almost 27 years with me. If by any chance you see me not being hungry, or if you say, oh, you were hungry last year. You were hungry 27 years ago than now. Please tell me. You're probably wrong. I think in my... Uh, Opinion. I think I've been hungry 27 years. I've been growing. I think, but I could be wrong. But even if you're wrong, at least it's still going to motivate me to examine myself, and I, I, just, I still want to grow. So please tell me so it will challenge me to grow. I pray that we'll be hungry church of Jesus Christ, always growing because he's all, all, always ready to fill us more with his grace and mercy and power. Secondly here, rebuke. The rebuke comes. With this as a foundation and the basis of how Holy Spirit wants to pour His power and strength upon us, forgiveness upon us. Now He rebukes out of love. Jesus' rebuke has to do with three things, three words, sleeping, waking, completing. Those of you who are sleeping, He wants to wake us up so that we can complete our task. Here we go, sleeping. It says here in verse 1, the reputation of being alive, but it says you are dead. So I don't think this means that church is completely dead, but the reputation of being, have, they have reputation of being alive, so to con contrast that it says, you know, you are dead, so uh, re uh, really uh, opposing the reputation. That's why in verse 2 it says, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. So not completely dead yet. And uh, again, like the picture, as we talked about in the beginning, is that they're falling asleep or they're sleeping because, not because they're bored, but they're sleeping because they're dying. So it's not because mom is waking a child for, uh, wake up, you got to go to school kind of thing, but waking up because the person is dying, bleeding and dying, and you need to keep them awake so that they will not die until the help comes. It's that kind of wake up. They are like sleeping because they are losing life. Sleeping. Waking. Verse 2 says, wake up. They're slowly dying means they're slowly losing life. They're slowly losing the light as they're, they're supposed to be the witness to the world. Like Ephesians, church of Ephesus. Like Ephesians, the Sardians are losing power to their outward witness to Christ. City of fame in the past, but no glory in the present. The, the attitude of the city that fell asleep and was captured has infected the church. Uh, they retain a reputation. The word reputation literally means name. They retain their name. They retain their face from being spiritually alive, but in fact they were spiritually, dearly, slowly, but surely dying. And they had reputation. What is reputation? Let's think about that word a little bit. Reputation. John Wooden, one of the best coaches, basketball coaches, he said, reputation is what people think of you. And then he compares it to integrity. Reputation is what people think of you. Integrity is who you are. There's a world of difference between reputation, what people think of you, and the reality. Who you really are. Reputation often can be generated by the past success, the perception of you because of that. You know, it's so sad to really think about when people talk about their glory days. Sometimes it's their high school, college, or in the past. They talk about their glory days. It's, it's that kind of sad thing that the present day is not their glory days. And I pray that as we, spiritually, as we talk about ourselves, when you talk about, give your testimonies and do different kinds of things, I pray that today will be the day that 
will be your glory days. Today is the day you love Christ the most. You need to love Christ more than yesterday, today, tomorrow more than today, two days after more than tomorrow, so that the day you die will be the day you love Jesus the most. Don't know. You, you ladies, you wives, don't you want your husband to love you like that? Well, that's how we should love Jesus. They were riding on the fumes of reputation, but they did not possess the flames of revival. They were concerned with what people thought of them, but not concerned with as much concerned with what God thought of them. They had fear of man, but only had the fear of man, but not fear of God. So in this case, they needed to be refueled. Refueling leads to revival. Intimacy leads to empowerment. I know some of you are, we need this balance of being alone and being with other people. I know some of you always want to be alone. You're energized, and I know some of you always want to be with people, but there has to be balance in our spiritual life that we need to be alone with God, having solitude and vertical and personal relationship with God, as well as being with other people, sharing the blessings, as well as receiving the shared blessings from others so that we can be strengthened. We need both balance in our Christian life. But you need to be refueled. You can't just live on your reputation. Spurgeon said, if the Lord be with me, it matters little who may desert me. Whenever you get hurt by someone, you need to realize how you care about the reputation, how you care about approval of other people. If you can love them, cannot love them because you're hurt by them, you are more concerned about their approval than the approval of God. Sometimes that shows how we care more about what people think of us than what God thinks of us. To us, Jesus is saying, wake up. Come alive. Be aware of his presence more than anything else, more than people's. So mandate of, mandate of Sardis is wake up in present active tense, meaning continuously stay awake. And the word is often associated in the Bible with prayer. Wake up. Stay awake. Make, make sure that becomes a condition of your heart, condition of your life. Even if you're sleeping, you need to stay, stay awake. What does that mean? Sometimes you can be, you can be awake and you're still, still sleeping. So sometimes you can be sleeping and still be awake. For spiritually, for Christians, even as you're sleeping, you go, Jesus, I want to see you in my dream. Then you're spiritually awake. The sleeping majority of Sardinian church had also forgotten grace received in the past. And Sardis had forgotten that it is engaged in a spiritual war, holy war, every moment of their lives. A lone Persian soldier came and snuck into the uh, city and so that their, their city was captured. We're always... In spiritual battle, we need to be, we need to be awake, sleeping, waking, completing. Therefore, they could not complete the work of Jesus Christ. Verse two: I have not found your works complete. It is interesting comparing to other cities. There was no external threats here. Most of the churches had in this in the first century. There were many Christians who were persecuted during the time. But the letter pinpoints to no specific cause of, of, of sleep unto death. No liquor ladens that were luring Christ's servants in Sardis into immorality and idolatry. No Balaam-like prophet, no Jezebel-like prophetess misleading them. The letter mentions no external sources of intimidation, social rejection, or persecution, such as other churches encountered from Satan's throne or Satan's synagogues, as the phrases were used. They had begun a life of faithful service, but something had happened which impeded further progress. Nevertheless, church was 
spiritually unconscious. Their spiritual life hit the plateau. You know, that happens. You know, you're growing, and then it hits, you hit the plateau often. Therefore, you can't complete the task that Christ has given to you. Their growth has ceased. Their reputation led to arrogance. They lost that holy dissatisfaction. What makes us to move at times because of dissatisfaction, holy dissatisfaction. I want to grow more. I want to become more like Christ. No fight left in them. No more fire in them. Perhaps some of you are like that as you're getting older. I was thinking, when do you lose, when do you hit plateau? When do you lose that fire? Sometimes when things go well, you, you, hit, you, you, you hit plateau because of pride. You become arrogant. Sometimes when things go bad, uh, because you get discouraged. Sometimes when things, things are mundane, then you look for higher pleasure somewhere else, and you get divided. Mm. So basically, at any time, you can lose your heart for Christ. Uh, you need to guard your heart, which is the wellspring of your life. I don't know if you're a, a women's NCAA women's basketball uh, fan. I'm not, but I know uh, University, UConn, University of Connecticut, had an incredible women's basketball team. They had like four incredible run for four years, and they finally lost. They didn't, I don't know if they lost once or twice, but they did not lose at all <laughs> and lost in this final four in this NCAA tournament. And, uh, you know, Gino Ariyama, the coach, incredible coach, perhaps one of the best coaches, actually. And in the, in the interview, this is what he said. Interestingly, he said, he said this, is, you know, maybe we weren't ready to play this. I go, what? This is one of the best teams ever assembled. Yeah, he goes, maybe we weren't ready. What he meant was, you know, all the teams that he beat throughout these years, went into the locker room and they felt this weight which generated them hunger uh, to fight, hunger to, uh, you know, win. But this is the first time in four years, right, uh, that they felt this, what other teams felt for four years. And he's saying maybe now they're ready. Maybe uh, next year they'll be able to play with that hunger and fight again to win. Now they're ready. Often we can become like this. We can become complacent. We need to be always be cautious when we lose holy hunger to fight and grow and overcome because we, are, we might be on the way down in our spiritual life. Never let complacency take over. Even when you're doing well, when you're doing bad, even when things are mundane, make sure there's hunger to grow, to be like Christ. Let's go to the third point, which is the instruction. Now, what can they do and what can we do? Uh, three things here. They have, to, they have to go to the, Jesus is giving instruction, back to the basics, back to the cross, and back to the future. Movie, movie title, if you don't know. But back to the basics. Here we go. Verse 3 says, remember then what you have received and heard. Whenever we go through these things, plateau or things get old, we go, oh, I want, you know, a different church. I got to go to a different church. I want different Bible. <laughs> uh, you know, we want different experiences with God, but what you really need is, is not different experiences with God, but you need deeper experience of God. There is no secret to Christian life in that way. Means of grace is ordained through the word of God and prayer. Church of Jesus Christ, small group, other believers in Jesus Christ. And through these old things, what, you, what, you, what, you, what you've been doing. But you need to really experience Jesus Christ through the means of the Holy Spirit, through the word. And as you get, have deeper experiences of God, change takes place. Circumstances might not change, but you change. Back to the basics, and then back to the cross. It says, keep it 
and repent. The nearer a man lives to God, the more intense he has to mourn over his own evil heart. We think that when we get closer to the Lord, we have less things to repent about. But you have to understand as you look into the scripture, what the Bible says, God is infinitely holy. So when we draw near to God, more things to repent because that's why we see more. We are more aware of our sinfulness and that gives us hunger to go to him to be forgiven, but also grace of God, pouring grace of God as your heart is emptied out. Grace of God pours into you because he's always wanting to stuff his mercy and grace into us. Spurgeon says, a sinner can no more repent and believe without the Holy Spirit's aid than he can create a world. So through the means of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to pour his grace upon us through the means of the word, and we need to repent. Repentance for Sardis, Church of Sardis, meant awakening. Awaken to the awareness of incredible grace that is available in Jesus Christ. Repentance means change, but not change yourself, but repentance means change of direction, that you go to the cross, not away from the cross, not dependent on yourself, but repentance means change. But not change yourself, but repentance means to be charged in your heart by His grace. Go to Him again and again and again. We are not repent. We are not repenting to reform ourselves, but we are repenting to receive from the Lord. That's why we can go to him again and again and again and again and again. Do you feel discouraged? Remember, it's a blessing for us that as sin lives, boy, is sin alive. As flesh lives, boy, is flesh alive in our hearts. And even Satan lives. We can almost see Satan living alive all over the world. But so Jesus lives. Jesus is alive, and that's all that matters. And he's going to strengthen us to overcome so we can overflow with Christ. Back to the basic, back to the cross, now back to the future. Meaning we don't think about the coming of the Lord Jesus enough. Verse 3 says, I will come like a thief. There's judgment coming. Often when this phrase is used, it's, it's talking about the final second coming of Jesus Christ and, and the end of the world. But often in Revelation, when this phrase is used, it's talking about temporary discipline of God as he comes, will not leave us alone in our sins, but consequences as it come, sin comes so that we can hasten and love Christ. And these disciplines and temporary judgment point forward to the final judgment that's coming. There are temporary judgments. Consequences of sins point to the final judgment that's coming out of his love. Just as parents who would discipline their children out of love so that they would not commit sin again in their future and, and grow. So that we would never stop wanting to grow in Jesus Christ. Never stop wanting to grow. Another person said, if I am not today all I hope to be, yet I see Jesus, and that assures me that I shall one day be like him. So when you are discouraged, just look at Jesus. I'm going to become like him. That's the destiny of believers in Jesus Christ eternally. You might have the fume of fire. Fume means fire is gone, but only smoke, smoke screen. But make sure there's fire of ongoing intimacy with Jesus Christ. Keep going. Fourthly, the examples. Now, usually uh, when the verse 4 starts with, yet you have still, he's usually giving encouragement to the church of Jesus Christ. So, uh, you know, encouragement usually comes before rebuke. But this phrase comes after rebuke. He's encouraging the church of Sardis. Now, I use the word examples because, you know, why is this section after the rebuke instead of before the rebuke? 
I believe the intention of Jesus, perhaps, is as he rebukes, he wants to encourage them by giving them the examples that actually did his instruction and lived out. And verse 4 says, Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. People who have not soiled their garments, probably an indication of righteous and holy living. So their garments may mean, may mean they did not compromise with pagan and idolatrous practices. And there were few. Not many. Many people fell away, but few. What's the difference between these few who were faithful and others who warn? Little phrase in verse 4, it says, People who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me. Of course, that's talking about eternal walk with Jesus Christ, eternal presence of Jesus Christ, but this is what they're doing every day as they deny themselves, follow Christ. And that's what they do. If you walk with Jesus, you'll be able to finish your task. If you walk with Jesus, you'll be able to fulfill his purpose in your life. You'll remain in him. Here, the hope of few people. I, I love the word few. Right? We, we know that. We know this word few because it's part of the, uh, part of the purpose Verses of, the, of CFC, harvest is plentiful, but workers are few. And Lord convicted us that we should produce few that Jesus considers as workers who can do the harvest, who can participate in the harvest. So here, the word few. The hope of the revival is in fact that a few names who are alert and unstained disciples can still be found in the church of Jesus Christ, in this troubled church. Their unsoiled garments symbolize consistent and obedient, consistent obedience and courageous faith. I say to the older people, uh, whether you're parents, spiritual parents, older brothers and sisters, you need to be a hope for the younger generation. That's why Jesus is talking about this few. You know, there are times that we fail. Now, don't, oh, that means I got to hide my mistakes. No, you show your mistakes. That encourages them too. But make sure you're fighting and growing through that process. Because as you're growing, that will give them hope. Hey, I can grow too. I go through ups and downs, but ups and downs, but not staying, but ups and downs, but I'm going to grow. In Christ. Make sure you give, you leave something that will remain forever. As you're thinking about your children and spiritual children. You know, often we are thinking about more of worth, earthly inheritance. Make sure they have good education. Make sure they can generate enough income. Big house, nice house. Right? Nothing wrong with giving those things. But inheritance is what you leave for someone. But a legacy is what you leave in someone. Make sure you leave spiritual legacy of your relationship with Jesus Christ in them that they can never lose in eternity. Last thing here, the promise. Verse 5 and 6, three things are mentioned, white garments, the book of life, and the phrase, I will confess his name. White garments. It says, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. Uh, who are clothed with white garments? Are they special people? Or are they all believers? I believe Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, it says, talking about all, all believers. It says, after... This I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes, uh, and peoples, and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. So it's all the believers in Jesus Christ. And a few verses later, because they are washed by the blood of the Lamb. We all wear dirty clothes, dirty heart, dirty body, dirty habits. But when we are washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, we can be clean. 
So it's talking about all believers. All believers wear white robes. But I love this next verse. Revelation chapter 19, verse 14. All believers are mentioned as, and the armies of heaven. So we are not just white clothes, being in hospital. You know, it sounds, looks like a people in hospital. But as we are washed, we become the army of Jesus Christ. The armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen and white, pure, or following him on white horses. I love, even, I love the verse even more. Next verse, Revelation chapter 16. It says, Then they were each given a white robe. Who are these people? These are actually martyrs for the sake of Christ who died. So they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. Complete what? Who were to be killed as themselves had seen. So what is that talking about? Putting it together. All believers wear white robes. And we become army of Jesus Christ uh, between the coming ones of Christ, even unto the point of death. But because of the blood of Jesus, because of as we deny ourselves, we say no to ourselves. You know, to the, the, the ones who die for Christ are the ones who can say no to their life for, the, for yes to Christ and yes for others. And we practice that in a small way. Give them that chance that we'll be able to say that too. To deny ourselves for Christ. That's comprehensive of what Christian is. White robe, blood of Jesus Christ. Fighting in the world with love of Christ. Even to the point of death. These are the people of white garments. Book of Life. Verse 5 it says, I will, I will never blot his name out of Book of Life. What is that? In the Old Testament, it was a register of all citizens in the kingdom, of, kingdom community. That's why if, Revelation 20, verse 15, it says, If anyone's name was not found, not found written in the book of life, it says, he says, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Because you have to face judgment of God according to your own deeds as sinners. That destination is different. Now, there are different books. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. It says, And I saw dead, great and small, standing before the throne. This is a final picture of the final judgment that's coming. And books, plural, open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. That's our names written in it. But if you don't have Christ, look at this. The dead were judged by what was written in the books. Different kind, there'll be different kind of books that records all of our deeds and will be judged according to what we have done. The phrase that says, I will never blot out his name out of the book of life doesn't mean that we can lose salvation, but it does mean that, and it does not mean that we, it, our names can be erased, it just means it cannot be erased. The ones who are saved in Jesus Christ, he will keep us. Forever. So the judgment is coming. White garments, book of life, the book of life. And third thing to look forward to is this. I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. Remember we, we talked about this church was uh, concerned with reputation of earth, reputation from people. Here in heaven... Jesus recognizes us. Not human being, but Jesus recognizes us. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. There's the reputation of heaven. If, you don't, if you're not concerned about reputation of earth, you'll have the reputation in heaven. You don't need to be famous on this earth. You'll be famous in heaven. I think all the, so many people that are uh, famous in this world, even what, who we think are good Christians may not be that famous in heaven. Only God knows who's going to be. There might be some unknown Christians who, are, who have been faithful all their lives that we don't know, that not many people know, might be very famous in heaven. 
Sometimes we can be mistaken. We do a lot of things and we think we'll be famous in heaven. We think we'll be acknowledged by Jesus. But Jesus might say one day, I never knew you. Look at this, Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. On that day, many will come and, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? name? Cast out demons in your name. Do mighty works in your name. They were doing for themselves, for their own glory. Verse 23, then I will declare to them. Jesus is saying, I never knew you. Recognition from, recognition from Jesus. Known by Jesus is the most important thing. At the end of all things, God will not ask us what we know, but he will ask us who we know. That we know Jesus. And this knowledge, this intimacy, this confession of name emphasizes intimacy, talks about intimacy in the Bible. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. This is a famous love chapter. Incredibly, beautifully written love chapter. In the midst of it, it says, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, For now we see in mirror dimly. But then face to face, we'll see Jesus face to face. And now I know him part. We kind of know him through the word. But then, then when he returns, I shall know fully. Wow. Jesus. Incredibly more worthy and beautiful. Even as I have been fully known. Heaven is a every day more. We, we, need, we can know Christ more as he completely knows us. It's talking about that intimacy and love relationship. And that's what this phrase means. I will confess his name before my father, before his angels. That we'll be forever loved by him. We'll be in him. And that's coming. Until then, in this world, we need to acknowledge his name. Now, that sounds like so burdensome, Pastor Man. That's like a lot of responsibilities. So, uh, to encourage us, I'll just leave with, you know, warning and encouragement here. First of all, warning. If you think about the reputation, like this church had the reputation, but the reality was different, right? So, meaning everyone thought this church was good. They had the reputation of being on fire, being good. So, oh, everyone thought this was, church, this was a good church, right? But in the eyes of Jesus Christ, they only had reputation. That means it's really hard to know when this happens. It's really hard to know whether, even as a church, even individually, we can be approved by God or not. Now, church had the fume, meaning it used to have fire, but fire died out. Fume, only smoke. No fire. Smoke still has the heat. Fume still has the heat, but no fire, which means slowly. It cannot sustain the fire. It cannot sustain the heat slowly. It's going to get cooler. It's going to die, which happens to a lot of people and a lot of churches. That's why be warned when this happens... In the beginning, be wary of the firelessness. I'm not just talking about emotion because we have two natures. There's sometimes hardship is difficult, so there's a lot of bad emotion here, but still there's desire. You might have some emotion, but it seems like you have no emotion because of this negative emotion. It's so great. So I'm not talking about when I say fire, just talking about emotion, but that desire to continue to live for God. Love Christ. When there's small increase of the temperature, so, I'm sorry, when there's a small decrease of the temperature in your heart, you need to detect that. Every day, make sure you love Christ more today than yesterday, tomorrow more than today. So it's hard to tell, this church. And my question to us, CFC, is that is CFC dying? We need to check this. We, I think we have good reputation, relatively good reputation, but is CFC dying? It doesn't matter what the reputation is. Do we still have fire? Are, are we living off the heat of the fume? We need to constantly check that as a church. You need to constantly check that individually. Warning. 
Pastor Ben, you, you are going to encourage us and still. <laughs> okay, one more. Encouragement. If you feel hopeless. I love this phrase in Revelation 3.2. It says, wake up and strengthen what remains is about to die. Meaning, this church was almost dead, but it says, strengthen what remains about to die. What is that? What is, a, what is about to die? You know that. Again, the work is not complete of them witnessing that light is dying. Right? It's talking about the fire in their hearts that shines to be witnessed so that work will be complete. But the point of the whole Bible and point of the Revelation and even uh, these three chapters is that believers will never die. Our hearts will never die. Meaning, even if you're doing terrible in your spiritual life, right now you feel like you're dead. If you're a true believer in Jesus Christ, you're like, you're like an ember. You might not have fire because fire died and it seems like you're dead and you're like, oh, I don't know. There's no fire, but you're like an ember. What do you, should you do with an ember? <sighs> Blow into an ember. Fire will come alive. And the Holy Spirit, uh, wind of the Holy Spirit, may the wind of the Holy Spirit blow through His Word. And your heart, you, though it seems dead, Word of God goes in, Holy Spirit, wind of the Holy Spirit, blow through your Word. Shh. May your hearts come alive with fire. How does that happen? Revelation 3, 6. He who has an ear, Make sure you listen to the Word of God. Meditate on His Word. Your ears will hear. Then your eyes will see Him. Then your hearts will be in flame. Ember will become fire. So that you can finish your work. Finish your journey for Christ. Therefore, never give up. Never give up. Keep on walking. He's going to strengthen you. Let's pray. Let's pray to the Lord for a few minutes. And uh, be, uh, some of you have never accepted Christ as a Savior and Lord. Just like any of us, say to Jesus, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. May your blood, one who died for me, may your blood be my cleansing. Help me to wear that white robe. Help me to stand among those who remain until the end. Maybe some of you what I just described, like an ember. It's been a long time. So many glory days. Certainly today is not, is not my glory day. But as you pray, you're waking up. Wind of the Holy Spirit will blow into your heart through His Word, and you will come alive. that you will shine like the stars of the universe. Not like a match light, shh, die out, but shine like the stars of the universe. He's going to strengthen, empower you. May CFC never die. Individually, if there are few, if there are few, if there are few of us remaining on fire, Strive to be the hungriest one in the church. Let's have that kind of competition. Holy competition. Holy dissatisfaction. Holy hunger. We'll come alive. We'll be on fire for Christ. And let's put the whole city on fire for Jesus. That's my desire. Let's pray to the Lord for a few minutes.